Please join me in welcoming our next guest, Jenny Johnson, Chief Executive of Franklin Templeton. Jenny. How are you? It is great to see you. Thank you so much for coming here this afternoon. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Excellent. Um, so I want to jump right in, Jenny, and maybe you can just tell us, give us a thumbnail sketch of Franklin Templeton's, technically Franklin Resources is yes. the name of the company, so don't get confused. People refer to... I finally learned where that came from. Which one? Franklin Resources. What is that? I was going to ask you, what resources do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know, Franklin Templeton was started by my grandfather, although my father took it over when it was uh, two and a half million dollars in assets and ten thousand dollars in revenue, so he never really gets the full credit for building the business. And so I asked him, I said, you know, why aren't we Franklin Templeton and why are we Franklin Resources? He said, oh, in the 1970s, you couldn't sell a bond or a stock. And they had all these tax shelters that were oil and gas tax mm. shelters and that were called resources. So I thought, well, if we call the company Franklin Resources, maybe that'll attract a little more attention. Ah, I got so there it. There you go. It's, it's <laughs> make it sound, I got it. I never knew. That's an interesting story. So tell us about the company today. Just give us a little brief on it. Yeah, great. So we're $1.7 trillion in assets under management. We're a you know, global asset manager. We're actually uh, we're, we're in 35 countries, clients in 160 countries. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is we're actually a top 10 alternatives manager. So we have about 200 and I think it's 55 billion in alternatives assets, which is real estate, secondary, private equity, private credit. Okay. And you've been chief executive since 2020, I think. 2020. Yeah, 2020. Right? Early yeah, 2020? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, Time flies when you're having fun. Right? <laughs> so um, what is your mandate? What is your strategy? What are you looking to do? I mean, it's just fascinating. It's like your grandfather's company, your father. You had a lot of family members. We'll talk about that. But what are you doing to move the business forward? Well, I mean, I, I, what I would say is, look, the, uh, what we do hasn't changed since my grandfather started this, right, which was uh, to bring investment assets to people, to the average person to be able to invest in. And so, you know, back when, when Franklin was started, it was actually difficult for the average person to get into the equity market uh, because they didn't have these pooled assets. And so the idea of, you know, people had created these uh, mutual funds. I think the first version was investment trusts, which had gotten a little trouble in the, uh, in the depression, but um, uh, eventually these mutual funds came in. And so I said, you know, that mandate hasn't changed. We try to help people achieve their most important financial milestones of their lives. Uh, my job is to make sure that the company is evolving and you know, the, in bringing people in, it's evolving with the tools, so technology is a big part of that. Uh, the investment access so that people have you know, good opportunity. I think the big question today is democratizing alternatives right now. Um, you know, the excess returns that had been over the last decade experienced in the private markets, um, you know, wasn't investable for the average person. So it's being able to bring access to good investments in a way in which uh, clients want to be able to hold those investments. Yeah, I want to drill down into that. Accessing the private investments by, by retail individuals is a huge topic. Um, but, but first, I want to ask a little bit more about your family and you and working at the firm with all these family members, third generation, the first woman to run the firm. Does that bring more pressure? Does it make it fun, more fun sometimes? All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think, you know, I actually think this is one of the things that maybe is a little bit lost in, uh, in public markets these days. I mean, I really think in terms of generations, you know, the investments. I, we're, I think, one of the real leaders in the traditional finance in blockchain. And uh, I think, you know, the reason I'm focused on it is it may or may not be material in my tenure as CEO. I think it probably will, but who knows? But I know it will at some point. And so making sure that you're investing in those things uh, that set the company up for the next generation, uh, as well as making sure you're doing a good job today. And, you know, my, my father, when I became CEO, he said, look, the most important thing is, you know, keep the customer happy and the business takes care of itself. And I think that philosophy is that sort of family responsibility that you carry on your shoulders 
in terms of the reputation of the company and the reputation of the family are very tied. And so it informs you on how you think about the business. And I think it gives you a longevity that at times uh, doesn't always happen in public market. Yeah, I read somewhere that you were you of your siblings was the one who was most interested in the business. I was. <laughs> the only it was one? a little teeny company back right. then, yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> um, and so um, I, I do want to ask you uh, about crypto and blockchain because you are you are keen on that. You're, you've pushed out further than some of your peers in that regard. And what, Jenny, would be some use cases that you can really sort of point to, you know, maybe not this year, next year, but coming up that really excites you about this technology? So you have to think about crypto as simply, um, simply just a, uh, a, a technology, right? But it does certain things really well. Uh, so, and I'll say it does three things really well. Number one, it's a general ledger. So if you have the right to say a token, right, right you, you don't need to go to somebody to validate that you have the, the rights to all the things in there. Like today, if you want to buy a house, you have to go to a title company and you buy title insurance. It's actually embedded in that token. So one is it's what you call a general ledger. So uh, if a transaction happens between the two of us, we have an absolute source of truth and if it came to me, I have ownership, and there's no question because it's public, and so everybody knows that I now have ownership. The second thing it does is it has the ability to do smart contracts. So if you and I do it at transactions, a lot of times there's some legal document that's sitting there. Well, that gets coded into the contract, and so actually we don't need anybody to come in and say, hey, by the way, a lawyer comes in, you know, Andy, you need to give Jenny this because this is what's part of it. It actually executes on its own. And I think in the case of climate transition, that's going to be interesting and important. I'll talk about that in a second. And the third, it has a payment mechanism. Uh, so I can pay. Now, you can argue is whether the types is Tether, Ethereum, Lumens. Are they, are they valid? You know, is Ether a valid uh, uh, source of payment? Well, there's a big market that exchanges those. And so uh, it enables this type of payment, which means it can enable fractions of cents to be exchanged in a transaction. So why does that matter? My favorite example is that Rihanna the singer uh, came out with uh, 300 NFTs, each one worth 0 .0, I think it's 0.00033% royalties in one of her songs. Mm. So if you buy it and, and the streaming service, say Spotify plays that song, the smart contract kicks off and it says, oh, I owe some money to somebody. It comes in, it finds that token, and it pays a fraction of a penny royalty, which means now I, as an individual, can actually access a type of investment that I never would have been able to access, which, by the way, would be totally uncorrelated to many other types of investments. And so there are actually, and I won't go through, uh, but there are numerous new types of investment models that are being created simply because of this technology enabling it, because it takes out a lot of the frictional cost in a transaction. But it also is a threat to a lot of the incumbents in the financial services business, because if you think about infrastructure, on a transaction, there's a lot of toll takers along the way. And so, you know, a toll taker might be somebody who proves, again, title insurance. It might be somebody who does a, you know, the, 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 foreign exchange settlement or custody. There's a lot of toll takers. And if, if the token itself handles that, yeah. then it's going to be less expensive. And I can give you a real example of how it is. We actually uh, worked with the SEC to, to launch a tokenized money market fund. So uh, we, we built a shareholder record keeping system uh, on, on blockchain. And um, we had to run it dual. We were actually one of the few asset management firms that still ran our own uh, shareholder record keeping system on our for our mutual funds uh, and so we had to run it parallel mm -hmm. and and I can't remember the exact numbers but over the period of time it cost us like seventy five thousand dollars to run the transactions on the old system and it cost us like a dollar sixty seven to run it on the blockchain system so if you can take out those costs you can drive down the costs of the services that we provide and it actually benefits the end consumer and then in a business that's you know obviously very competitive on costs that's a good thing so i think uh that that there's huge opportunity to one from efficiencies that happen and two i think new investment opportunities that are going to new business models that are going to come out of it how did you get into this? I mean, what was your, did you have an epiphany moment where you met some, some um, you know, crypto bro in a bar somewhere, yeah. in Menlo Park or yeah. something, or what happened? I was, living, uh, I was living in Silicon Valley at the time. No, so I ran our technology department and I realized, 
I, I realized, like, technology, the guys who run the technology departments, all you're doing is moving data from one place to another place, and sometimes adding it. And you know what the biggest problem is? The data's bad. You, you don't, you, you, you know, the timing of this system hasn't been updated, and the guy grabbed it too early, and now it's, you know, uh, wrong data over here. And so it was this realization that, like, this is the big problem in technology is really, you know, the speed to move it, the efficiency to move it. So I understood the, the problem. And, and reconciliation, every financial services firm has a huge staff of people who just reconcile between systems. Oh, and by the way, after they finish, they have to go reconcile with their counterparty in the street. So I understood what the problem was. Now, my team always gives me a hard time because I'm famous for saying, uh, look at, you know, I think this blockchain thing's really interesting. It's going to be important, but it's not going to be my problem. It's going to be my grandchildren's problem. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the early systems are, you know, they're still, for a variety of reasons, slow. But these various layer ones, so Ethereum's a layer one, you know, Bitcoin, you'd argue, is a layer one. Uh, these are platforms, think of them like your iPhone, and people build businesses on top of them. So Ethereum is a layer one. People build businesses on top of them, just like with your iPhone, people build businesses on top of that. And the transaction processing was pretty slow. And so I thought, ah, oh, it's not really going to be, it's not going to really be working in my time. And then you started to realize that actually, I mean, why does the New York Stock Exchange close at 4 o'clock? It closes because in the old days you had to reconcile your books for the next morning. Right. And so um, I started to say, wow, actually, there's a bunch of transactions that don't need that speed. And, and then I got more and more involved in, in it. Steeped in it. <laughs> um, your company has grown by acquisitions. I remember going all the way back to the 1980s when you bought L.F. Rothschild. I mean, <laughs> that's how old I am. But then there was, I remember, the Templeton Mutual Shares, my, my old guy, Michael Price. Oh, yeah. Michael Price. Yep. Um, Chuck Royce. Yes, yes. Uh, Leg Mason with Bill Miller, yep. his firm, yep. Putnam. Why did uh, you guys choose to grow this way? And is it been, why is it good for customers and for shareholders? Ticker B-E-N, Ben, get it, um, publicly traded company. Um, so, the, 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 you know, each, each time there were different reasons. I think at the time that we acquired Templeton in 1992, it was this recognition that there was going to be tremendous growth on the international side. And so we were primarily uh, much more of a fixed income manager, and Templeton brought us a, a really global equity manager, and so that was the reason. Our more recent acquisitions have been really focused on two things. One was filling out what we saw as product gaps, um, and so it just take, several of them were in the alternatives, so Benefit Street Partners, El Centro Private Credit, Lexington Partners, Secondary PE, um, and uh, Clarion Partners, which came with like Mason, was real estate. Uh, so they were filling out what we had decided was a secular change where we needed to have more exposure to the alternatives. Uh, Putnam brought us stable value and target date. We think the retirement channel is really important, and we know that we've been underrepresented in that channel. So it was either filling out product gaps or what we saw as another secular change. Um, after the financial crisis, the world shifted, the world of the kind of wealth channel, the financial advisor channel, shifted from being kind of fee-based, commission-based to, sorry, commission-based to fee-based. Right. And what ended up happening was the client started getting billed. It used to be embedded in the product. You paid your advisor through a product. You didn't really see, you didn't have transparency into it. Well, now that advisor bills you every month. And so the client sees that. And what's happening is the client's saying, hey, advisor, I'm paying you every month. What else are you doing for me? And so the good news is the average person is now getting the kind of service that used to just be available to the ultra high net worth. So they're getting with it from their financial advisor, uh, estate planning, tax efficiency, you know, financial planning. In some cases, they're saying, you know, educate my kids. I talked to one financial advisor who said I had to negotiate the prenup for one of my clients because he didn't want to have that conversation with his son-in-law. So as the advisor's being required to do more, we wanted to invest in tools that would help the advisor do that. So some of our acquisitions are related to just being able to not just provide investment tools, but also some of these other tools. And, and what you see is the, the large distribution firms are tending to narrow the number of firms they work with and expecting more from those firms. Right. You know, stocks of uh, asset managers and money managers have kind of had a tough time of it lately, and your company's no exception. What's the market not getting or getting wrong about 
um, Franklin Resources? Is it that they're focused on, you know, oh, the, all the actions in passive and you guys do active? Or what are they not figuring out? Well, I think that, that there has no question been uh, this concern about can active managers really outperform passive. Um, so, and anytime there's a momentum market, you know, if, if you're an active manager, your job is to provide risk adjusted returns. One of the greatest risks that I think is always underappreciated is the risk of not diversifying a portfolio. So if you're following the S&P 500 and you get the Magnificent Seven, you have this high concentration of a few stocks, an active manager looks at that and says, mm, I, I feel like that's maybe an overweight there, and so often will lag in momentum markets. Um, but I always describe it a little bit like if, you know, if I said to you, Andy, I want you to buy a car that gets you point A to point B at the cheapest per mile cost, you go get the car with no bells and whistles, easy, well-paved roads, straight. But if you had to go over a mountain pass in a snowstorm, you're going to wish you'd paid up for those safety features. And to me, that's what active management does, is that it's in market volatility. So I think one is, is that. Um, the second is there is a view of this transition from vehicles of mutual funds to ETFs that are probably, the view is that the passive ETFs are lower margin, but what's happening now is they're becoming active ETFs. They're actually taking off. And um, I won't go into the details, but I think they're, they're probably uh, less of a margin differential than maybe the market appreciates. And then in our case, um, there is a real desire to see us as a traditional manager be able to grow an alternatives manager. There's a question about whether those cultures are different and can a traditional manager really grow an alternatives managers? And we feel very good about that. Jenny, I have to ask you about a recent uh, DOJ SEC investigation. You guys are doing an internal investigation as well concerning allocation of treasury security derivatives at your Western Asset subsidiary. Um, is this the result of maybe buying so many firms and having too much autonomy? And what's the status right now of that? <laughs> There's no upside to commenting on anything that you're getting a regulatory investigation. But uh, look, I, here, here's what I'll say. Um, you know, this was an isolated incident with one person. And, uh, you know, Western has 115 other investment people. And so the, 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 what happened there didn't go on with anybody else. Uh, and we're, of course, cooperating. Um, you know, when we have been very clear that our, in buying asset managers, we leave the investment teams to be independent, but we provide the support around um, the rest of the business. Investment in technology, I think, you know, investments in things like AI, it's hard for a boutique manager to keep up with that. And so we're trying to provide those things uh, at the center. And um, Western was slightly unique in that they were more independent than others because of a, a, a sort of a, at the time of the deal. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the future is going to be about how individual managers can leverage from the scale that they get. So the scale from perspective. So one of the things that we were able to do when, when for example, Silicon Valley Bank uh, was, there was questions about whether it was going to go under or maybe it had just announced, we were able to pull a call together. Our venture capital team talked about how they had talked to entrepreneurs and, uh, and VCs who were telling them, oh, we're pulling our money out. And by the way, here are the other banks we're concerned about. We had our, obviously our equity and our fixed income team. And then we had our private credit teams, distressed debt, who had mapped out every bank in the US and who, where the, the exposures were. And a lot of that wasn't known. It came out later. But to have that at your fingertips literally on the day because you're able to give that perspective made everybody feel better about going in and talking to clients. And then, I mean, as Roger talked about with AI, look, I think AI, uh, for companies who don't adopt it and figure out how to leverage it well, are going to be left behind. And a big part of that is what internal data do you have? Everybody's going to have access to the public data, but what also are, is your internal data that you're going to be able to train your, your models on? And so to be able to do that, you need scale. And that's where we're trying to share that much more uh, for all our teams. And just a quick follow-up, though. Any idea when this investigations will wrap up or be resolved? You never know. I mean, we are we are working we are working with the regulators and and uh, we are cooperating on this and you know uh, very focused and very focused on you know making sure that it is 
isolated and that we continue to be able to focus on our clients and the rest of our business. Fair enough. I want to go back to the point you made about, and we were both discussing, uh, about retail investors getting into the private markets. And, you know, it's a, it's a huge subject that everyone's talking about. A lot of it has to do with, you know, say Silicon Valley and the unicorns. And not only are they out there and retail investors can't get in them, but when they do go public, all the juice has been squeezed out of the citrus fruit already. Because, you know, instead of going public after three years, they go public after 10 years, and the guys on Sand Hill Road, the venture capitalists, have gotten all the money. And so it's kind of anti-democratic, you could argue, et cetera, et cetera. Where is, where is the SEC in this, though? I mean, in other words, what's the difference between a public security and a private security? Should there be any difference anymore? You have to be an accredited investor to get into these. I'm kind of rambling on and on, but this is something you're keen on, right? Yeah, so it's interesting. I, um, you remind me, I was on the stage with two, uh, two of my peer CEOs that were totally from the private market side. And we were addressing a room of financial advisors, and they were like, you guys just got to understand there's better returns for all those advantages. You know, the early, the, those early years are captured in the private market. You should just put your clients in there. And I remember thinking to myself, you, you, you don't understand what these guys are thinking about. First of all, I'd had breakfast with a few who were talking about, you know, that they don't have the back office to handle all the K-1s and the capital calls. Well, that's, you know, problem one. But the second real issue is a financial advisor is the tip of the spear. They are on the hook to really understand what's suitable for a client. And if they have a client who they think can handle the illiquidity of these funds, and they can be you know, some of those private equity funds that thought were 12 years are, are leaking into 15 years, and they put a client in there, and it's not suitable for that client, that advisor is going to get dragged in front of FINRA. So they have to really understand it. So being able to, to think about the right vehicles, uh, you know, you start to see these perpetual types of vehicles, and of course there's a challenge because you need to price it daily. But I think the industry is working hard to figure out ways to be able to bring those private markets responsibly to the, to the wealth channel. And in the end, I'm a real believer that that financial advisor plays a huge role in figuring out the suitability for the client because the illiquity issue is, is real. Are you hearing um, from the marketplace that there's demand? Huge and demand. demand from yeah. retail oh. investors? Um, definitely the demand from the advisors because they recognize the benefit to portfolios. And, uh, and you know, we spent a lot of time working with uh, big distributors on trying to think through this problem. A lot of 401k platforms are trying to figure out, is that a good mechanism to deliver it? So yes, you know, I, I think depending on people's level of sophistication, uh, they may understand it and, and are asking for it. Um, but you take private credit. I mean, right. you know, the old, it used to be that the banks, it was public credit, it was banks syndicated loans and they securitized them and sold them off. Well, with the change in capital requirements, you just don't see banks doing that as much anymore. So if you want to get, uh, you know, a good diversified fixed income po portfolio over time, that's probably going to have some private credit in there uh, just because the two are converging so much. Uh, so I think that we as an industry have to figure out ways to solve this. Right, and then there's sports teams. We haven't even talked about that. <laughs> yes, there are. A piece of the NFL, an NFL team, etc. And that's coming up right now, right? For sure. The, 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 you know, each of the, uh, the organizations have their own rules around ownership. But I think what's happening is these teams have become more and more valuable. They're trying to figure out. Uh, and actually, I think it was the Green Bay Packers. I can't remember exactly the details, but I think it was the Green Bay Packers that tokenized um, a part of the team ownership. And... Uh, Essentially, and by the way, this is one other piece of tokenization that I think comes around, is you're going to start to see, I think you'll have equity that's tokenized, but you're going to start to see rights in it. So Nike, I think, issued, if you own certain Nike stock, you can get specific shoes that are exclusive. I think you're going to see loyalty programs starting to be tied in with the ownership of, of uh, equities through these kind of tokenization programs. All right, well, going back to crypto then, I mean, isn't a concern, though, when you've got something like, you know, every five or ten years or three years, you have some, you know, big disruption like the Sam Bankman-Fried episode? Yep. And what kind of a path is that? So, first of all, I, <laughs> not all cri crypto is created equal, right? I mean, there, there is, uh, it is definitely the Wild West as far as from an investment capability. And so you need to understand the space, number one. Second thing is I think what's underappreciated in the um, in the 
uh, FTX situation is that was a private blockchain. Mm -hmm. So um, private blockchains, you don't see the transactions. Like our money market fund, the transactions are on a public blockchain. Your personal information is kept on a private, and we keep that privately, but it's on a public blockchain. So if FTX had been built on a public blockchain, I'm pretty sure the community would have seen those transactions and asked questions. And there's a resistance to public blockchains. I actually think primarily by those who are in the infrastructure today because they'd like you to use their own private blockchain because they can stay in and keep charging the tolls that they're charging. Uh, but I think it's going to be very hard over time to, um, to compete with a public blockchain. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So again, I mentioned Ethereum is, like, uh, is, is a layer one. So people build businesses on Ethereum. So Ethereum was originally designed to be what was called uh, proof of work. So you heard Bitcoin is bad because of all the computation. It uses a lot of energy. Well, Ethereum was built the same way. And so companies, and, and, it, and it's all about when you validate transactions. It had to do these computations. And so it sort of people recognized, the community recognized that that would not be a good long-term sustainable approach. Mm -hmm. so, they, so the community decided we need to change to what's called proof of stake. And what that means is you have validators. So Franklin is actually a validator, I think, on, on 13 different um, layer one and two platforms where we validate transactions. Uh, and so we, what we do is we, we stake some of the tokens on that platform. So Ethereum, we'd stake ETH. We stake it and we validate a transaction. That doesn't use energy in the same way that you do when you're computing. So the community says, we're gonna change and we're gonna switch. This is a major architectural change, I mean, major architectural change. There's no project manager, there's no Gantt chart saying what the, but, and it, while it happened and it was delayed, it happened and it happened without really a hitch, which meant every business that was built on the Ethereum platform had the benefit of a major IT spend without costing anything out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. That's why over time the public blockchains become more and more difficult for the private chains to compete. And then I would say on a regulatory front, because the regulators will have the ability to view transactions, they'll leverage AI and they'll actually be able to see patterns. And I think they'll find that they have more visibility than they even do today. Um, so, you know, again, I think like the internet time, there's going to be a lot of that has to, that will fall out to the side and not work. Right. Uh, but you will have the next, next Amazon and Googles and others that come out of this space. All right. Any questions for Jenny? We've got time for maybe just one or two. Otherwise, I've got one right here. I know I have zero credibility. We're going to get a microphone to you in terms of like suggesting questions. You, you weren't here, and I promised questions for Roger. And then oh, I did. didn't. Um, Apologies. I was curious, you've gone through a kind of interesting ride, how you've taken over from family members, and I'm sure there was some level of old guard there that you had to navigate and then create your own brand. And I'm just curious what you think makes you a good leader or what you admire in others about leadership. Um, I'll tell you what kind of people ask me about how do I think about leadership? And I always say it's my four P's, people, passion, purpose, and persistence. Uh, people, honestly, look, it's all about the team you put together. Like, there's no one person at Franklin Templeton. We are one. And making sure that you have the best team is the only way you're gonna be successful. Uh, passion, love what you do, and you never feel like you're working. I mean, believe me, I'm working a lot of days these days, a lot of, a lot of weekends and nights, and the good news is I love what I do. Uh, and then, so it gives me energy. Describe it in a purposeful way and people will get behind that. So when we talk about helping people uh, achieve the most important financial milestones of their lives, like people go, yeah, I feel good about that. And I tell the story about saying, uh, I have five kids and asking if anybody was gonna follow me in this industry. And my daughter goes, no, mom, I wanna do something that helps people. And I'm like, this is a business that helps people. Clearly, I don't describe the purpose enough. And then finally, persistence. And this is what my father probably taught me. Look, there's going to be really tough times, really tough times that you go through running any business. And um, a lot of times, the difference is uh, in, between success and failure is, this is what my father taught me, is who kind of just hangs on long enough and sticks through it. And so being persistent during those tough times is part of leadership and, and rallying people to follow you. 
Well, Jenny, we have to leave it at that. I really appreciate you coming here this afternoon. I appreciate your candor in answering all of our questions. Please join me in thanking Jenny Johnson, CEO of Frank Rice Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really great, really awesome. Thank you.